most policies today actually, you know, sold today actually are called extended replacement policies. This is the most common type of policy that we see. These increase your coverage lim a limits by a set percentage. Common with the 25%, 50%, or 100%, if it turns out that your coverage age limit is not enough to repair or replace your damage or destroy property. A few insurance um, companies or policies will extend those benefits, those extended benefits will also ride to some of the other coverages. So you want to be on the lookout for that. In our experience, not many, but some do. So you kind of want to just be on the lookout for that. Most of those policies apply those extended benefits, that extended replacement endorsement to A only. But again, it's an important piece of your policy benefits you want to understand. In terms of the dwelling claim process overall, Often, the dwelling claim settlement process is going to begin with the insurance company preparing a scope of loss on your destroyed property. A scope of loss basically details the materials, the quantities, the cost, range of work needed to repair or replace your destroyed or damaged property with current building codes. A scope of loss is more detailed than an estimate, all right? So sometimes your contractor might give you an estimate or a bid, a scope of loss is typically much more detailed than that, all right? The scope of loss is really important. And the reason it's so important is because it typically forms the basis of the settlement on the structural portion of the claim. That's why understanding that scope of loss is, is a really kind of key foundational piece. It's, you know, in settling out the structural portion of the claim. So you want to provide your adjuster with as much detail about your pre-loss dwelling as is possible. Sizes and shapes, how many rooms, you know, what kind of finishes, what kind of, you know, windows, what kind of casings, what kind of molding. You know, use whatever information that you can get your hands on to recreate a detailed description of what your property interior and exterior look like before the loss. What are some possible sources? Building plans, if you've got access. Photos. I mean, obviously your photos might be gone. We weren't home in our prior head, so we didn't get any photos out. But you know what? Family members who had attended events at my house have photos. They have photos of, you know, the walls and the appliances in the background, that birthday party shot of my son. So I'm just saying that, you know, even if you don't have any photos yourself, but maybe the friends or families, you know, have photos that detail certain aspects of your house in the background. So just think broadly, you know, brainstorm broadly in terms of what kind of, you know, resources you can use to recreate what you have. Oral descriptions, you know, uh, talk to your friends. If you, do you remember anything particular? I mean, don't be afraid to do that. If your, your mind is anything like mine was after the fire, I mean, I was muddled, and that would be being kind. Uh, I'd say it took several months uh, slash years, I don't know, for my whole critical thinking power to, to come back online. So, you know, definitely ask friends, go over with family, talk about it so that you can really recreate what you have. Once your scope is done, we found that it typically is very helpful if you can get two independent estimates from licensed contractors, reputable contractors, and work towards a settlement with your insurance company based on those independent estimates. Now remember, when, the, when negotiating your dwelling and settlement, focus on the home that you lost, and again, the cost to replace the home that you lost, all right? This is an important um, strategic point here. Problems often arise if you try to negotiate a settlement on the new home you want to build instead of the one that you have, all right? The insurance company may fall the plans are, you know, for the new home are bigger or better in some regard. So again, from a strategic standpoint, our experience has been that we're going to settle up easier, quicker, more uh, streamlined, again, by focusing in on what you have, reach agreement on that number, and then move forward to what you want to build. So reach agreement on what it would cost to replace what you have, all right? So again, as was, what went down is generally what the insurance company is obligated to pay for. So again, focusing in on that. Well, what my rebuild estimates are higher 
than the insurance company's scope of loss, that scope that they prepared online downtown. Well, when there are gaps between the insurance company's numbers and yours, you might be being lowball, all right? That's when there's a differential between uh, the actual cost and the numbers that are being provided. So again, lowballing is a very common problem. It's different from underinsurance. Remember, underinsurance is when you don't have enough in your policy limits to fill what is lost. You could be underinsured and lowball. I mean, it's possible for both of those things to happen in the same time, all right? So again, lowballing, that's when the insurance company's scope of loss, and thus the offer of what they're willing to pay to repair or replace your home is less than the actual cost to repair or replace. Candidly, you may not even realize that you're being lowball. I mean, few people have the construction expertise to really look at a scope of loss and say, like, oh, that number looks low. I mean, I'm scared to even go to Home Depot. I don't know. That's not really my bag of tricks there. So, again, you could be getting mobile and not even realize it. So, hence, that kind of emphasizes the importance of getting a couple of very credible, independent, reputable estimates. Does everyone get mobile? No. No, they most certainly do not. So I'm not saying that's going to happen to any or all of you, but I'm just saying that is a problem. If we look at the 2010 Boulder area wildfire, the Four Mile Canyon Fire, in a plain status survey that UP conducted of Four Mile Canyon Fire survivors, 65% of respondents reported being getting global estimates from your insurance company. You can get a full survey results at www.uphealth.org. So again, it's not an uncommon problem. Why would my insurance company will call me? For the same reason that anyone in a large money business transaction makes a, makes a low open bid. It's a, it's a negotiation. How can I counteract it? So, okay, I think that's what's going on. These numbers aren't matching up. If that happens, it may happen to you. It may not happen to you. But if it does, what can we do? Well, get and present to your insurer detailed written estimates from reputable independent builders. That's one you can do, that's a starting point. You can also consider hiring your own expert to create an independent scope of loss on your destroyed home. That's another strategy. Also, you can set up a face-to-face -face meeting between your selected contractor and your insurance adjuster to reconcile um, pricing and scope differences. These are all strategies. So think of it in terms of different tools in your toolbox. If I encounter this problem, what are some different tools that I can avail myself of to, to you know, get my way through this and resolve it? <coughs> all right, so scope of loss versus an estimate. So we talked about getting two probable estimates. That's one strategy. And we also talked about potentially as another strategy, hiring somebody to do an independent scope of loss. Really, what are the difference? talked about it just a few minutes ago, kind of alluded to it. A scope of loss is a general proposition is more detail, much more detail. Um, you know, it could be 30 pages, 50 pages, whereas an estimate is anywhere typically from maybe 2 to 10, 2 to 8. So it's typically just much, much weightier, much more detail. Um, also more expensive. Um, you know, an estimate is less detail, less expensive, sometimes free. You might have a contractor who's willing to do an estimate for you because he's trying to earn your business on the rebuild. So he's willing to do an estimate on the house that went down because he's trying, you know, to earn your business, right? He's trying to create a rapport with you um, to, to earn your the business to rebuild your home. So again, he knows that all things, there's, you know, pluses and minus. The scope of loss is more detailed. That's a plus, but typically it's going to cost, usually around a couple thousand dollars. So, you know, the estimate, less detailed, so perhaps less precise, so potentially. Um, but, you know, typically much less expensive. So you need to kind of weigh everything out depending on what's going on in your claim. Just remember that detailed and credible documentation increases your negotiating power. Um, one big advantage of the scope of loss, the independent scope of loss, is it will allow you to compare costs apples to apples with your insurance company. Um, typically, independent scope of loss will be in the same format, hence why we have Mr. Arnold explaining scopes of loss and cost estimating software in a few minutes. Um, it allows you to compare apples to apples which makes it, uh, typically makes it a more streamlined for setting up that structure for a shorter plan. So kind of just understanding these different 
processes and how they run from the pluses or the minuses. You know, maybe I can get through with some estimates. I don't have to shell out some money for a scope of loss, or maybe I'm stalling in this negotiation. Um, I'm still getting global. I can't get any further. Maybe I'm going to have to shell out some money for a scope of loss. You know, these are you know kinds of the kinds of decisions that you think about as you go through to figure what's happening. Or maybe we've already gotten paid in full. That's the best day of our life. So that seems good. Now, who prepares an independent scope of loss? Typically, either a construction estimator or a contractor. It's typically going to be maybe even a forensic architect. Potentially, those are some different trades that would potentially prepare an independent scope of loss. Where our home went down, uh, we were local, and so we did shell out some money for a scope of loss because that's it's what we needed to do to get that money to move forward. And it was for us, it was a good investment. Um, and I remember one of the biggest things when I first even heard about this as a consequence, like, who does that? Like, can somebody raise our hand who even does that? And so this is kind of who you typically find. Again, construction estimator, contractor, or maybe even a forensic architect. The, really the goal, whoever you hire, is to find somebody who can prepare a line-by-line -line scope that can be compared with the insurance company's scope. Apples to apples in the same format. Do you see what I'm saying? So that you can effectively compare where the cost differentials are. All right, so again, these are the qualities, quantities, and costs for each room. A couple of tips if this ends up being a direction that you need to head at some point for hiring a construction estimator or a contractor to prepare a scope. I would say, first of all, have they asked them, have they prepared a scope of loss for an insurance claim before? First question. What are their professional qualifications? What's their background? What licenses do they hold? And then check their licensing. Is their licensing um, ask for references and check them? To me, this last one, actually I think the last two are good examples of tasks that you can offload to a friend or a family member. I don't know if you guys have a well, I had a you know luckily a good forum with people like, I'm here, anything you need, I'm in your swamp. This would be the kind of stuff where I'd be like, check these references, get back to me, you know, offload it to somebody who's offering to help you. Because your to-do list is way, way too long. But again, don't skip over this because you're so tight on time. And I think that's whether we're talking about hiring a construction estimator or a contractor to build your house or any professional as well. I think this is one of the very tough things as a fire survivor. And I speak from first-hand experience. It's we're so overwhelmed with everything to be done, plus holding down my job, raising my two kids, that I, you know, it's easy to not follow the typical business protocol that we would in normal circumstances. You know, normally when you're talking about transactions of this large money, you know, the large money amount, you know, of course you check references and check licensing, but when you're exhausted and you've had exactly three hours sleep, it gets very tempting to kind of um, short shrift. So again, remember to seek help from those who have uh, offered to assist you. These are good examples of things that you can offer to help. Clarify the extent of their services. Clarify the extent of their services. Does the cost of that preparation of the scope of loss include the time that may be spent answering questions from the insurance company about that scope? Or is that an additional fee? I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it's good that you know this in advance. You know what I'm saying? So clarify the, the scope of their services. Also, are they prepared, prepared to defend the scope of loss during litigation and litigation? And if so, how much do they charge to do that? I'm not even saying that you would, you would want to do that, but I think the fact that whether they'll answer yes or no tells you something about how confident they are in their scope and their scope services. So even if you're in the mindset, oh my gosh, I would never litigate in many years, that's trouble on top of trouble, I, we still think asking that question to somebody that you would consider hiring is an important one. Because again, it kind of gives you, a, you know, at least a gauge on a level of confidence. Um, also, have they ever had to defend a scope of loss um, in a litigation context, I would tell you. Let me just say this, different insurance companies use different processes. Um, not all insurance companies will prepare a scope of loss to value um, the cost to repair or replace a disorder or damaged home. Many will, but not all will. If your insurance company is not doing the scope of loss themselves, ask them how they are valuing 
your loss, all right? So if you're not doing that, this is the most typical process that we see on the structure, but if you're not doing that, then how are they valuing your claim? And just remember that whatever process the insurance company uses, your goal is to fully document and negotiate a settlement of your uh, structural claim that will cover the true cost of repairing or replacing your damaged or destroyed property. That's the end goal. So again, this is the process that is very commonly used and here are some different issues that can arise. Here are some strategies for how to navigate some of those issues. All right? All right. Uh, before I bring up um, Hal, I just want to um, build on what Carla said a little bit earlier, and I'm just going to add this one note on carriage shares. Um, let me just also add, I know she said that, you know, you've, you've got the food truck out there. I felt the same way, um, you know, when my house went down. I remember being in my own disaster recovery center, and like Red Cross was, you know, giving out, I don't know if they did it, you know, they did, you know, they did the death cards. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, like, I don't know if I should take that, because I was thinking like, I'm oh, employed, and we've got insurance. And I remember telling that to the baby, I'm like, I don't want to take it, but if there's somebody who needs it more than me, like, I don't want to take somebody who might need it more, it's like, oh gosh, we're both professionals, and I'm like, I don't want to take from somebody, and I, I still remember that Red Cross lady setting me straight, uh, very in short order. And I remember she told me, she goes, listen, everybody has donated this for you, regardless of your means, regardless of your income, regardless of everything. These people in San Diego have donated this, and she goes, she goes, we don't know yet what the future's going to bring on this claim, which was true. Like, we, you know, we weren't under insured, and we didn't know how that was going to eventually play out or roll out. She goes, take everything that is offered. And she goes, if it helps you to think of it this way, and she goes, there's no obligation. She goes, but if it helps you to think of it this way, she goes, at the end, if you're even, you know, if you come out okay, she goes, just don't be fair. And I was kind of like a little light bulb going on for me, like, oh, all right. You know, so I, mean, I think everybody's got their own perspective on that, but for, at least for me, that was kind of a little, you know, oh, I get it now. And that's what I did, and I have to say that that stuff is really helpful. Like, I was thinking with parents share, like I said, regardless of the fact that it's free, they don't have to go to the grocery store tomorrow. It's one more thing on your to-do list. And, you know, and again, if that's when my husband and I, at the end, we have, you know, made it pass, or houses we built, like, okay, we made it back, and we're all right now. I actually put donations back to those 501c3 charities that had helped us. And I was like, hmm, put it back in the kitty. You know, so again, if, if that perspective helps anybody just understand, I think it's a really hard thing when you lose your home. I'm not one, I'm usually the person would write the check, I'm not getting the resources, and it was really kind of on my end. So I just encourage you to take everything that's out there, because over time, resources will dwindle. And you kind of never know how everything's going to play out in the long run, so take everything that's offered. And Again, just my own personal perspective, if it helps you to think like, oh, if you're so inclined, put it back in the end if you're okay. I don't know. That helped me do it, and it, it worked out all good. So, anyways, with that, I'm going to turn to our guest speaker, Mr. Hal Arnold from Justice International. Um, Hal has come to explain cost estimating software, and I want to say, too, they were very sweet. Um, Hal and Bruce from AI. Also, on the black table right before you go out, they brought their personal property memory jogger list from AI, which is very nice of them to share that with us. UP has a memory jogger personal property list online, but they very kindly photocopied the one that they use in their business and have donated it, and it's there for you to pick up if you want another memory jogger personal property list. So thank you, that was very kind of you guys to do that. Anyways, let me bring it up. Hal's got many, many years of experience adjusting structure plans, and he's going to explain our cost estimating software. Well, I uh, entered the business in 1979. I've seen a lot of changes in the estimating process. Uh, when I started out, we had a uh, insurance contractor's price guide, and we just simply uh, hand wrote the estimate, and then we uh, uh, get the secretary to type, and then we had an ad and take on each page to do your advocacy. So, I've actually seen a lot of changes take place uh, in the uh, estimating process, a lot of which you know, I'm pleased to tell you have been, uh, have been on the positive side. Um, now, insurance companies, uh, they use uh, estimating software that I have to make that sends all 
or new and some ability to found a secondary program basically is decided how much they're going to pay you in advance before you even have the time to file. And the um, the uh, the the thing to understand about the estimating program is that there are more than one selection to choose from when you're when you're estimating something. For example, if you're going to be replacing carpet, there is standard carpet, there's regular carpet, there's high grade carpet, there's premium carpet, so there's a number of of uh, selections to take when an estimator is preparing the point. How, how many people here, I'm just curious, how many people here still have open structural claims uh, ongoing right now? And, and how many people here have total, I mean, have slab claims here? Just have a slab. So I take it, take it most of you are partial loss uh, uh, insurers. You have partial loss. So you have total loss. You all have total loss. Okay. Ask that question again. How <laughs> many people have total losses? How many people here have total losses? Well, I'd say that's the majority. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you hold well, I think if you're here because you're not getting off the total losses. Hold the mic up. Hold the mic up. Okay. Okay. The insurance companies, uh, as I said, because the insurance company, gen uh, company generally utilizes the information generated by the software to generate the scope of loss, which will be the basis for determining how much you can pay on the structure plan. So, what uh, companies like Example make does is that they uh, they have different cities for which they have price guides, and the price guides are taken from the general community of general contractors who do the particular type of work that the insurance companies look to for uh, unit costs. As many of you probably already know, unit, uh, unit costs are, I have, I have a living room that's just say it's 10 by 10, it's 100 square feet of carpet, remove and replace the carpet 100 square feet, $4 a square foot, $400 of that line item. That's referred to as the unit cost system. The unit cost system is the most accurate estimating uh, program that you can have to get you reimbursed for your property damage claim. So the insurance companies, when they use the, uh, the estimating program that they choose, as I was saying earlier, they decide in advance how much to pay you. They're using the price guide within their program. One of the interesting things that I found about using these programs uh, internally for the internal use is that if I am a property adjuster and I am at your house and I have down and I'm selecting to remove and replace the carpet and I know it's $3 a square foot in the program, if you tell me it's $4 a square foot based on what you pay, if I change the price to four dollars a square foot for the claims examiner who's later looking at the claim for approval, they will see on the screen a color of green or red, depending on which uh, color the insurance company chooses, so that the claims examiner knows it's going to change in the price system. And that will raise a red flag and they'll ask why that change was made. And then they'll say, well, then the homeowner tell me it was $36 a yard, $4 a square foot. And the claim is down the way, where's the estimate? Well, it was turned up in the fire, so they didn't really have anything. And that will actually slow the uh, estimating process up. So then when they give you the estimate, you don't see these things, but these are things that are going on in the background in the, uh, in the claim examining process that, uh, that you're not aware of. One of the uh, sayings in my profession is that if the scope of loss is correct, then everything else will take care of itself. Uh, the, uh, 
So, in the short laws, you, you, know, you want to identify what really needs to be done. So you have to, in, in cases where you have federal kind of lawsuits, you almost have to sit down and, and think about what you have. You have three-inch space boards, is it four-inch space boards, three-and-a-half-inch space boards? Is it solid piece base boards? Is it fender joint base boards, stain gray base boards, paint gray base boards? So there's a lot that goes into uh, developing the correct scope of loss that will determine how much you're going to get paid later. So you almost have to uh, think about what you can. Sometimes I've heard that uh, people actually know their family members and say, look, I know you're over here at Christmas time. We took a lot of photos and we go to their friends where they can have parties and people who are with you. And they'll actually go to these people and say, Can you make me some copies of photos that you took while you were at my house? And that kind of helps job the men because you'd be surprised sometimes what you're not thinking of when it comes time to identify the proper scope of what needs to be done to put the house back like it was prior to the insured peril. No shortcuts, exactly like you were applying to the law. Question? You know, can we go to our questions? Because we're going to do a Q&A at the end. Okay. Is that all right? Thank you so much. I should have said that at the beginning. Sorry. Thank you. The, the insurance company uses various uh, people to determine the scope of law. Uh, they either, it could be an in-house adjuster or it can be a, a third party uh, uh, person. One of the new ways that I've seen in the insurance community today, one that I'm not particularly, uh, not really particularly excited about, is the new building consultant. What the insurance company has done now is they've actually hired, it used to be that the insurance adjuster would hire the new building consultant uh, to assist the insurance adjuster in becoming the correct stuff and loss. But now the uh, claims examiner is the one who hired the building consultant and it's kind of like a check and balance system to make sure that the insurance adjuster is doing his job or her job correctly and not overdoing things. And uh, so they hire a building consultant to be the eyes and the ears of the claims examiner. I've often found that the building consultant is often making decisions that used to be strictly and specifically reserved for the uh, insurance adjuster and only the insurance adjuster, such as determining the amount of appreciation that you have until the conclusion of the claim. It's clearly an insurance adjuster's responsibility and not a building consultant's opinion that should dictate how much the totals are in the insurance claim. So, um, but here, you know, the, as, as I stated earlier, the most important thing to do in your case is to identify the proper scope of what needs to be done so that you're including everything that needs to be done that's in your house. If you do that, generally, everything will take care of itself. The potential downside of, uh, of the, for the insured, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple of other items later too, but um, and, and exactly, uh, you can, when you select whatever you're going to do, whether it's replace the stud wall, or replace drywall, or replace texture on the wall, or paint the wall, and I've got some examples of this in the slide, is that you can click on a picture of any line item that you're selecting, and it will tell you what's included for that price, and it will also tell you what well, a lot of people do not ever even know. I've known people that have used the Japanese for five years, and they did not know that there are some things that were not included with the price. And, we'll, and I'll show you a couple of those items here later. But, uh, so the, the downside is that if you have someone who's not and if there's not too much what I call a superior product knowledge of the program, one that chose to be an expert in the program, if you don't have that type of individual, then you can actually get shortchanged. Not that the individual is shortchanging you on purpose, but you're just getting shortchanged 
because of the lack of knowledge that a person has, and you don't know that he doesn't have this because you see the play moving the place you are wrong, but you don't know that the price doesn't include texture, or it may, or it may not include walls over, it may not include considerations for walls over eight feet, things of that nature, that are clearly spelled out in the pictures of the print. It basically goes into what I was just basically saying. It's, 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 it's critical that, uh, that you have uh, construction experience, uh, or at least uh, a lot of estimated experience. You know, every, every uh, wall, every room has a wall, a floor, a wall, and a seat. And everything in between my doors, rooms, and cabinets. And I found, you know, if you, if, you, if you can put down everything that is in the room that you can see and then take into consideration the things that are behind what you cannot see and put the house back together like a puzzle, you know, it's all a puzzle. It's room by room, area by area, front elevation, right elevation, left elevation, rear elevation, <laughs> roof, attic. You think about everything that's there and, and put it together like a puzzle, then that is what you're actually looking for. So there are, there are exceptions to not having construction experience. If you're a professional, there's professional estimators now uh, that full time all they do is estimating. So you should have substantial experience. I would say you should have five years or more experience in estimating property at this point. If you're going to have a shot at getting 100% of the life in your pocket. And this uh, firm like the one that I work for, Justice International, Colorado Support, and the Insurance and Law Firm, Dr. Dyer, and the Independent Scopes of the Law. We got it's, the microphone's getting worse. Oh. I, it's just, I shouldn't be struggling so hard to hear you. You're very yeah. kind of it. Right here. Yeah, give me a minute. So, so, so in, in the one area, one area of time, like I was saying earlier, room by room, line by line, line by line, that's, that's really what it's all about. And you think about each area, the, the floors, the walls, and ceilings, everything in between, like those windows, the cabinets, faucets, toilets, toilets. And even in the estimating process, you want to, uh, in the damage inspections, you want to have the site inspections, preserve all the photos that you can preserve, and uh, if, because there will be necessary records that you might need if you'll have to you end up having to speak with your engine something. Establish spaces for light time and quality such as grounds. You know, every stove is different, every built-in uh, uh, benefit is different, so plans are important. And uh, so we want, we want to review construction documents, plans, soil reports, like geotechnical surveys. Anybody got any geotechnical surveys that they did for their rebuilds? Very important. Uh, you have to understand the code upgrade. You know, many cities have about the 2005, 2012, you know, international building code. So you have to find out what are the code upgrades that are being used by the municipality that you live in. Uh, because that is the basis of which you're owed under the policy under the code upgrades. And again, then we just deconstruct and reconstruct the project, counting bricks and sticks, and put out on a line basis. Um, uh, and then you have to think about your custom work, because custom work, you're not going to find an exact way. So a lot of your custom ceramic counter jobs that you might have, or custom countertops, they're not always going to be uh, accurately reimbursed under the exacting that program. Now here's some examples that I was telling you about earlier. Um, you can see that if you're doing concrete and you the forms and installation labor, uh, labor to remove it, 
but it excludes the slab reinforcements. And it tells you to select C and C, S, L, R, E. That's going to be the rebar that's in the slab. So if you're looking at your exactly the estimate from the entrance company that says remove and replace the six inch slab, you're assuming that includes the rebar in the slab. And the estimator may not know, because he never looks at the picture, that, uh, that the slab is not, is not complete, it's not 100 percent conclusive, you have to include the slab reinforcement as well. Uh, here's uh, doors. You know, most people think that remove and replace a door and you tell the adjuster, does that include the hardware? Oh, yes, I'll include it. It's one, one, one unit price where it tells you that the hinges, the lock set, other hardware, painting and staining are not included. You have to list that separately. If you look at the, uh, one of the things I do like about exactly make sure there should be no dispute on the appreciation. If the insurance company uses exactly mode, it says that the average life expectancy of a particular item is 100 years. So if your house is 24 years old and we're talking about this particular door, it should be 24% depreciation maximum. So a lot of times, you know, this depreciation is in the eyes of the beholder. And the insurance adjuster, instead of taking the time to look at each item that's time consuming, which if you do it enough times, you get so familiar with it, you don't have to look at it each time, which just that's the downfall of it. So you can actually ask the insurance adjuster if they're using exact data. Any program they have is give you the backup from their program that's the basis for the decision they make. And then use the actual business claim support. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can get your, you can look at the contractor's estimate, and you can also erase everything but the scope when you copy a page. Leave the scope only. Get that to several contractors to bid and say, "Tell me what you think might be missing, and price what you do think is fair." And to sum it up, you know, exactly estimating software allows a qualified individual to present the cost of restoration. Uh, and also, we found that uh, if you have uh, if, if two people are using the same software program, comparing apples to apples, you generally have the least amount of differences of the very Thank you so much for running through the cost estimating software overview. It's a big topic. What we're going to do now is move to our partial loss considerations. We'd like to thank Carrie. Hello. Thank Carrie Olivier, Baldwin County Fire Survivor, partial loss survivor for sharing her experience and her knowledge and going through a partial loss claim. And a little feedback, so okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. We're glad okay tonight. Um, and I want to mention something quickly that's kind of off the subject a little bit, but I wanted to acknowledge that we have um, some people here from Aspen Point also. Um, Waldo Kennedy had a team um, provided by FEMA dollars, the only FEMA dollars pretty much that came into our community, I think, but uh, of all the kind of um, helpers through Aspen Point counseling services. And you now, Black Horse has a team also in there. Um, some of them are here tonight. Would you guys stand up, please, so people can see that you're here? And they are at Black Horse Brothers. So please don't hesitate to use um, those services either. No one is prepared to go through what you guys are having to go through, and it can create some interesting challenges, and they're there to help me with that. So with that, I'd just like to suggest that everybody kind of shake out, take a deep breath for a second um, while we switch to another similar subject. Uh, equally as complicated. <laughs> and and um, I'm going to focus on mostly partial loss. A lot of you I know have partial and total loss, and that you may have an outbuilding that was completely lost, and then smoke damage in your home, or you may have thermal damage in your home where your windows are affected and your sides.
society that the inside seems to be okay. So um, those kinds of losses have some particular challenges because in addition to being able to figure out what it's all worth, you have to demonstrate what the actual damage is. So with that, Okay, so first of all, I just wanted to touch on this. I know um, many people have already gone home and they're just trying to still figure out what's going on with their homes. How many of you are, still have homes standing here tonight? Okay. And how many of you are back in your homes? Okay. Um, just quickly through this slide, um, is your home safe to live in? I went back in my home after a week, and uh, I'm still not 100% sure <laughs> um, because, you know, there are respiratory issues and other things that can happen, but these are just some, some um, things you can consider. If you have a medical history or present symptoms, things like respiratory illnesses, asthma, cardiac issues, um, immune problems, uh, then you should take the um, more conservative stance before you move back in your home. If you have infants or elderly in your home who are more susceptible to the problems that can be caused um, by smoke and soot in your home. Um, homes built prior to the 80s, there are a lot of those in black forests. We didn't have to deal with that quite as much in Waldo Canyon, but can have asbestos and lead in building materials that can be released in your neighbor's homes and transferred into your home. Um, if there are obvious noxious odors or particulates around your home, that's definitely a red flag. Um, and then, um, in addition, problems with potential problems with septic and wells um, that you may not even be aware of, um, something that might have affected the water in uh, another neighboring area that's in your same aquifer. So the county has done a great job, the health department, in providing resources for you guys to check that out. And um, I hope everyone will do that, and continue to do that, be diligent about that. If you do suspect there are problems and you're not ready to move back in your home, or you feel like you need to leave your home in order to do remediation and be safe, how do you get your insurance company to pay for that? That can be challenging. Um, generally, they want you back in your house, <laughs> and they want you back in your house, they don't want you to leave your house, because um, that opens up a whole other segment of cost, obviously, which is additional living expense. Um, and just like every other topic covered tonight, and always, it seems, with insurance, it's all about documentation. And it's actual documentation that can be verified that is going to be the most effective. So um, go to your medical providers. Go to um, <clears throat> certified, verified um, experts to do testing of your home that you can use to uh, support your concerns and to alleviate your concerns. So if it is, in fact, all clear about you know it's safe to move back into your home. And I'll get a little more into uh, the experts as we go. Um, Always do things in writing with the insurance company. Um, what you say, what they say, is quickly forgotten. I'm on my 10th adjuster with my insurance company. You know, I don't even remember who said what. So the advice of having a claim diary and putting things in writing, if you can get an email um, communication going that you can keep track of and print off and go get back and forth, that is great. That saves a ton of time. If you need to send a certified letter, do that too, and let them know you're doing that. If they won't give you something in writing, you put it in writing and send it to them and ask for a response within a specific amount of time and that you will assume they agree if you don't get a response. That way you create your trail of evidence that you will need to petition them to do what you need to be restored to your home. Um, again, Okay, so tonight we're primarily focusing on structural damage rather than on contents. So again, these are the things that if you picture them up and shook it out, put it back down, they would still be there. If you sold your home, they were things that would still be attached to your home. 
not your personal possessions that can be removed from the home or have been lost. Um, so how do you even begin to wrap your head around what kind of damage can be there? I had no idea when I returned to my home, so grateful um, that it was there, that there could be so much damage that wasn't obvious. Uh, there is visible damage, but sometimes it requires close inspection. So you have to really decide if you're going to look and see what might be there. Um, that can include things like the pitting. I'm going to show you some pictures and examples as we go. Um, plastics are particularly susceptible. Um, electronics, um, things like your sprinkler system controller or your thermostat in your home. Um, maybe um, some of the other electronics that are part of your household. Um, warping. Um, very often, um, decking materials, gutter materials, um, they may sort of at first glance look okay, but if you get down at an angle or get up above your gutter line and look at it, you will notice it's not the same as it was, and there really isn't an explanation for that other than heat. And heat can be transferred a long distance in um, a major wildfire, and it does very kind of um, it, what seems to be a logical thing is in that the heat may affect one level of your home more than a lower level because heat rises. So you really have to, to take a close look. And it's important to note, let's say you have a cause of death. If you just have a few burn spots in that deck that are obvious, it may be that's all you need to demonstrate to your insurance company that that should be addressed and perhaps replaced, repaired or replaced. If it cannot be matched with the existing deck, let's say you have four boards that need to be replaced. Um, if, if it's, you know, 10 years old and you go to buy new decking material, that may not be available, the same decking material. There is a, a light kind of quality and a visual line of sight that matches requirement. Because remember, the idea here is that you have an indemnity policy that should be restoring you as to, to up to policy limits, only up to policy <laughs> limits, whatever those um, are, to where you were before this event occurred. And sometimes that means total replacement. Um, even though part of what you're replacing it may not replace it may not be damaged at all, but the value and appearance is negatively affected. So you have a contractual right to expect that to be returned. Um, hidden damage, uh, you need to look from different perspectives sometimes. You know, if you're just a pain and you didn't go up in your attic. Or maybe he went in your attic, or she went in your attic without a flashlight, kind of peeked around and said, oh, it's fine. That is not a proper investigation of um, attics are one of the places that the smoke and soot seems to be pulled into through the vents around the house. And your insulation could be full of soot, carbon, smoke. And, um, and that affects the insulating ability, as well as creates some potentially noxious odors. So that's a common area that is, is overlooked, that you have a right to request a proper investigation of and to look to have um, some, something done about it. Um, inside the walls, many people remove um, the face plates of, um, of your switches and plugs, and sometimes you can tell if smoke has entered um, inside of the walls, and that way it affected the insulation in there. Um, vinyl windows, my windows looked fine. I thought they were fine. I was a full block away from um, actual homes that totally burned. And yet I found out um, that my windows on the two sides of my house, my new vinyl windows were completely ruined um, because they no longer had the seal. Everything just blew right in. And when it rained sideways, <laughs> um, water came in my house. And um, it took about uh, 10 months before I was able to provide enough information and lobby my insurer, but, but, but I did ultimately um, gain that agreement to replace those windows. Uh, latent damage. This one is tricky too. Keep your claim open as long as you can. Even though you don't want to deal with it anymore, you want to get on with your life, 
there are some big issues that can show up later after a full cycle of seasons. So stucco can be dried out and cracked as you go through the cycle of seasons. The changes in humidity around your home and in your home, as well as the heat, can create some interesting problems in wood and, uh, and all kinds of materials. <clears throat> Um, let's see. You know, one good thing to just remember is um, that word proof of loss. If you can document a covered peril damage, so fire and smoke are generally covered peril damages in most homes policies, then if you can document it visually or with an expert report that is um, hard to refute, then there's a good chance that you can get payment for that to to recover. Take lots of pictures, save them on digital files, um, use verifiable experts. Um, there are all kinds of people knocking at the door, nobody's, you know, a knight in shining armor. Um, everybody's there for a reason and make sure they know what they're doing and they have your best interest at heart. Um, specific requests in writing. If you don't ask for what you want, likely you won't get it. So <laughs> ask for what you need in writing. Um, Never dirty your claim. Uh, I have had many cases that I have seen and witnessed myself where an adjuster may say, oh, you know, for, for total loss, for example, put four bathrooms on their, on their workup. And you say, well, no, I only have three. And they say, oh, don't worry about it. Worry about it. You, it needs to be accurate because you are going to sign it and if you dirty your claim by putting information that isn't accurate, you may lose some of your rights under the policy. So um, just push ahead for what you need, but do it with accurate information. Um, and don't, don't pick no for an answer until you're really ready. I and mean, everybody's ready at a different point. Um, but I, um, there's so many things <laughs> that um, they have said no multiple times to, to me that they ended up saying yes. I want to show you these pictures really quickly. Um, I don't know how easily you can see this. This is the uh, gasket on the inside of a wooden casement window. Um, that gasket is bubbly. It's got a little sort of a pattern in it. Before the fire, it did not. The window is not necessarily foggy, but heat has impacted this. This was in a home that was in, surrounded by a burn area and was refused coverage. Ultimately, we got a structural engineer in to look at this and to write a report and to document it, and the windows were covered. Um, this is one of those, this is the gutter. You see the kind of wobble in the gutter there? That's another one that was denied and then ultimately approved. This is um, a doorway, threshold, out to a deck, and there was fire suppression efforts there with water, and water came in and discolored the wooden floor. Um, initially, the insurance adjuster said, this is just damage over time, but it was a covered deck, and the rain never came in. Um, so over time, we began, we were able to get an ex wooden floor people and a structural engineer to say this is water damage and it's recent. This wooden floor was um, repaired and refinished. Um, this is actually my composite deck. Um, I had a neoprene rug that I left during the fire. The other rug that I had in front of it that had been there um, all summer, every summer, uh, I had rolled up and thrown off because um, I was afraid it might be flammable when we left. And so it couldn't be blamed on sun. And, um, and I went to the decking company and um, said, you know, is this covered by warranty? And they said, no, this is not typical. And I pursued it and ultimately the insurance company covered um, my debt. It took four rounds and negotiated to get enough money because of the ball and to go to the deck, but um, it was covered. And there were also a few burn marks. And it, as it turned out, the burn marks alone would have, would have um, done it. This is masonite siding after it's been power washed. The insurance company only wanted to power wash the siding, obviously, and not paint it. Well, this is what the soot eventually 
did when it was power washed and its staining couldn't be removed. This was eventually covered to be painted, primed and painted. So, um, I, I just wanted to give you a few visual examples and examples to say don't give up. If you believe it's damaged and it should be repaired and you have a, a good, a good standing policy and it's covered, then lobby. Just document heavy soot or ash deposits in the attic, carpets in your padding. The insurance company's going to do a step by step approach and work clean before they replace. Um, so you may need to go through that process, but make sure you um, you just pay attention. Yellowing and premature wear of plastics and textiles, um, corrosion of electronics, and painted finishes and surfaces can become pitted and sticky. And you can clean them and clean them, and they never seem to get better. So there's a higher level of remediation that is required to restore it. So while your claims are open, pursue those. And remember, when in doubt, check it out. If your gut tells you your home is not okay, then, then check it out. Get some help and check it out. Patience and perseverance pay. That is just the way it is. It's a long process, but if you persevere and remember to use your insurance company and the relationship with the adjuster as the vehicle to get you where you want to go. If you get too mad to talk to them, if you feel like it's not going well, step back, take a breath, ask for a different adjuster. But fighting them or getting angry it will not get you where you need to go. So um, take those few breaths, do something else for a while before you go back at it. That is the vehicle to get in home again. Um, and stay in charge. You know, no one can really, really um, help you unless you stay involved. Whether you hire professionals, whether you hire adjusters, um, uh, you hire attorneys, you hire um, anyone, structural engineers to help you, you still know your home, you know what you had, and you know what you need to be put back again. So stay in control of your claim and seek help if needed. Um, there, you know, there are people who will help you. They want to help you and they're frustrated they can't help you. So give things over to people and let them help you with tasks. Um, it's a blessing to give as well as to receive that. Um, any work you are going to have done, whether you're building a home, you're repairing a home, you're cleaning a home, check the references on the phone, actual recent references, talk to people, ask questions, um, and get by lateral contract signed. In other words, make sure that you're not the only one with responsibilities in those contracts to pay. Make sure that whoever you get contracting with has a list of responsibilities to do certain things for you under those contracts. And then, here's my final slide. At one of the recent meetings for the fire there at New Life, my car was damaged by hail. So I got to meet with my lovely insurance company again with the catastrophic team to deal with my health claim. And I was sitting there waiting for him to give me his estimate of what my car is worth because they said it was total. And here's the adjuster sitting next to a printer in a box with a no smoking sign. Oops. With a no smoking sign. And I said, why is the printer in the box with a no smoking sign? He, he, he does typically car hail adjusting, so he doesn't do fire adjusting. And he looked at me and he said, electronics are very sensitive to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to share that with you. You <laughs> were. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and 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 uh, condensed into a single presentation, both low volume and under insurance. Uh, I'll click through my law firm stuff. Uh, let's see. 
There's just a little bit about me. I've been doing this 26 years, 20 years on the other side, working for the insurance company, so I know what I like to say, I know how to think. I now work exclusively for people like you. I specialize in first party property insurance, which is what your types of disputes are. I've tried to positive verdict dozens of insurance cases, so hundreds, probably really thousands of them. And then uh, something I'm particularly proud of is uh, my recognition as a best lawyer, which is something that is voted on by my peers, and that is in the field of insurance. Uh, okay, let's start by lowballing is prohibited by Colorado law. So what is lowballing? And lowballing it shows up typically in three different ways. One is artificially reducing the scope of repairs. As uh, was said earlier, most pricing tends to follow scope. So scope is what was damaged, what was in the house, or what we belong to micro folks on structure, what was in the house, what was uh, made up the house before it burned the ground, or before you uh, suffered uh, significant losses other than burning to the ground. Artificial reducing the price of repairs. And that is, uh, and I, I didn't get to hear the entire presentation earlier, but just because an insurance company is using the Xactimate program does not mean that they are accurately reflecting in there the quality of the finishes. Very frequently, the, uh, I can't really verify this is true, but I've seen enough times to believe it to be so, the, def the default that the insurance companies use will be the cheapest type of window, will be the cheapest type, type of carpet, will be the cheapest type of fill in the blank. So, uh, that's an area where they may artificially reduce the price of repairs and then hold this, but it's a computer program. We don't have them sit over this. Well, that's not really true, as you heard earlier tonight, which is there are different gradations within the exact program, so be sure and be your own best advocate there. Or any combination of the above. And one other point I bring up as a subpart of B there, artificially reducing the price of repairs, is the depreciation. Uh, so far, most of you have probably, uh, who had a total loss, have probably received what the insurance company will call actual cash value payment, which typically is computed as, um, as they have computed it, as taking replacement costs and then taking some percentage rate of depreciation. So if the insurance company, uh, they didn't get big and fat and profitable by overpaying claims. So uh, think, think of it from the perspective of they're going to use the greatest amount of depreciation that they can possibly justify. Why? Because then they don't have to pay you as much. They can hold on to their money a lot longer. So uh, take a really hard look at what the depreciation percentage is that has been applied and know that you don't have to have an across the board rate of depreciation. Different things depreciate at different rates. Sheet rock. If you were to come back, so long as it was adequately maintained, come back and look at this wall 50 years from now, it should look exactly the same. So why is there a 30% rate of depreciation that's applied? For a roof, depending on the type of roof, okay, you know, there's probably a different rate of depreciation that applies to that. Um, low balling is prohibited under Colorado law, and it's uh, prohibited in a number of different places. There is no place in Colorado law that says that we call it low balling. But that would say low volume is prohibited, so we need to kind of fill in some, some blanks here. One place to look is the what I call the Unfair Claims Practices Act. And uh, Karen, all these slides will be on the UP website, so if any of you want to come back and take a look at these you know, hieroglyph numbers of the Colorado Revised Statutes, you can go back into the website and look and see. So among the things that it prohibits, are misrepresenting facts or insurance policy provisions related to coverages. Well, as you heard, they typically are supposed to provide like, kind, and quality. Not close to the quality, but like, kind, and quality. So if they try to pass something off as other than what their policy provided, that would violate the first bullet point there. Failing to acknowledge and act reasonably promptly upon communications with respect to claims, they're supposed to get back to you within a reasonable period of time. Refusing to pay claims, and this is a really, really biggie for you guys tonight, the top bullet point there. Refusing to pay claims without conducting a reasonable investigation based on all available. I'm one of the top size acts, that's the point that I get on uh, all the time when I'm in trial. All available information. So what does that mean? Please do your own homework. Do your own 
investigation, get a contractor's estimate. While it's nice to have it be an exact format, most contract, most home builders don't use the exact format. So go out and be, uh, be your own best advocate. Go get an estimate and provide it to the insurance company. It may be for a lot more than what the insurance company is offering you. Well, guess what? That's part of what is all available information. The insurance company now has that in the file. They need to pay attention to that after you have provided it to them. So don't just wait sitting idly by for the insurance company to be the conductor of the choir. This is your house that you're talking about. Be your own best advocate. Go get a, a contractor to give you a bid. Not a, the next bullet point. Not attempting in good faith to effectuate a prompt, fair, equitable settlement. Claims which liabilities can be clear. So what's that mean? If they have the information that can justify a payment, they need to make the payment. They need to pay you the actual cash value. Most policies will say that replacement cost is not owed until it's incurred. So when do they owe that? There's a couple of different ways that insurance companies will approach that. Oftentimes it uh, can be when you have a signed contract uh, or your contract is pulled permit and now they know that you're really serious, you really are going to incur it, the insurance company may cut you the, the check. Uh, other times the insurance company will go to the opposite extreme and say, until I see that the bill from your contractor is there and it's due, then I'll cut you the check. Under either way, you guys shouldn't be coming out of pocket for it, but that's that when they owe typically the replacement cost. Actual cash value, all of you should have already been paid something. Is anyone in here who has not yet been paid actual cash value for the house? So uh, a couple of you, um, please go to your adjuster, follow up with them tomorrow and say, when am I going to get my actual cash value payment for my house? You should have already paid this. You're supposed to make prompt, fair, and equitable payment of funds. Um, they're supposed to tell you when you make a payment, what the payment's being made for. Uh, they're supposed to have standards. I, that could be a topic for a different kind of, uh, different uh, seminar. Uh, compelling insurers to initiate litigation to cover amounts to an insurance false fraud for substantially less than the ultimate recovery. Well, the ultimate recovery kind of connotes that there's a lawsuit, but this is still an important provision. This is all part of the Colorado Unfair Claims Practices Act. To say, hey, don't make me have to sue you in order to get you to pay me what you owe me. The insurance company just is part of your obligation. I talked about this a little bit last night this year. You pay your premium. That's your fulfilling your part of the deal. So now what's the insurance company supposed to do? The insurance company is supposed to pay you your claim. All right, so as we're hearing the rain pitter pat on the roof, I hope that's um, Let me make one quick comment. This also applies to the wall of pain uh, people to your friends on the west side of town, which is uh, insurance companies typically have exclusions for flood. If any of you end up having mud damage and uh, additional damage above and beyond the fire, I would like to make the argument to them. I've not yet had occasion to do this, so I'm not telling you that I made the argument successfully. But I would argue to them that the proximate cause of that loss is not this rain, it's not the mud, it's the fact that there was a fire. And fire is a covered cause of loss. The insurance company will look for the easy way out. And I, I, I made a note as I was driving in tonight on Shoot. I say that right? Shoot Road. And I saw sandbags. And I thought, okay, I know what these people are trying to prepare themselves for. So if you, if you suffer additional damage as a result of any floods, such as, you know, uh, at least I saw them in the uh, man, two springs, and we've probably driven through that area. Remember, I would, I would argue that's a result of a fire, not as a result of a flood, because the insurance company will try to exclude that loss. All right, my, my digression. Uh, there is a statute, uh, another statute in Colorado that allows you to claim to the insurance company, you know what, if you don't pay me in a timely manner, if you unreasonably delay or deny payment of a claim, they can be responsible for double damages. That means not only the amount that they owed you to begin with, but two times that amount as a penalty to them. And if you end up having to hire a lawyer, 
no insurance company is going to pay that amount voluntarily. They have to be sued in order to pay that. But they would also uh, pay owe the legal fees and uh, the costs to obtain that uh, judgment. But that's, additional, that's an additional arrow in your quiver to uh, aim at the insurance company in the event that they are unreasonably delaying the payment of the claim. And that delay part is really critical because oftentimes insurance companies play the game of delay, 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 and then the very last second here comes the payment. But we didn't deny what the statute which went into effect only was uh, 2008. Uh, tried to address that by saying you can't reasonably delay payment either. Uh, all right, so there's some cases uh, also other than statutes. Um, basically, that the insurance company said we need to treat you in good faith. This is an important part, and this is a, a slide that I shared once before, but now you're starting to get to that point where insurance companies may try to quarrel with you over uh, replacement costs saying that code upgrades uh, exclusively fall within their code upgrade coverage. Uh, if you have enough coverage under the code upgrade coverage, that's fine. But if, uh, for many people, they don't have enough coverage to, to, care, to cover that difference, and if you have replacement cost coverage, you have a pretty solid argument against them that if you have to upgrade the code in order to replace, that you do get that coverage under your replacement cost, not only under the code upgrade additional amount that is uh, perhaps provided for under your policy. And there's a case there that insurance companies don't like it when you uh, talk Dupree versus Allstate, but uh, that's the case that allows you to make that argument to them. I'm going to get into the underinsured problem uh, in the second half of this presentation. Uh, there are some insurance bulletins out there, and I spoke a little bit about these last time. Bulletins are guidelines to insurance companies. Uh, they're not requirements, but it does say that insure, this particular bulletin, insurers shall make reasonable attempts to settle things promptly so that you can try to comply with the timing requirements of the policy. And then this one is really important for people affected by a widespread uh, problems such as what you have experienced, because I dare say there, there may be some materials cost issues and some labor cost issues that you guys perhaps face that others who may have an isolated incident don't have to face. And it's all about supply and demand. There's an awfully big demand in here and perhaps a limited supply of labor and materials. So insurers are supposed to consider when determining what, how to calculate your replacement costs and what they should pay you for. They're supposed to consider, pursuant to this bulletin, uh, Things that perhaps aren't are not picked up in the estimating programs, such as slope of land, building grade of dwelling, availability of labor and materials. So just know that there's a insurance bulletin B.5.28. And you can find this on the DORA website. It's under the Colorado.org. Uh, so Colorado, I think it's Colorado.dora, D-O-R-A.org. DORA is a division of regulatory agencies. It's a state. Website. So you can now, you type in State of Colorado Insurance Division of Insurance, so we'll to find where these regulations are, or bulletins are. Uh, I got a lot of questions about this one after we were done last time. Um, if a policyholder decides not to rebuild or replace, the insurance company cannot, in addition to taking a, a deduction for depreciation, they cannot also uh, deduct for uh, a contractor's overhead and profit. They have to pay the overhead and profit if you decide not to rebuild, but you're only taking the actual cash value. Um, appraisal. Uh, so the appraisal clause is another avenue that you have if you have a disagreement with the insurance company. If, if you've made your best pitch to the insurance company, you say, this is what I think you uh, owe me, or this is what I think it would cost you to build my home, and the insurance company says no. You do have an option under your policy to request appraisal. It has nothing to do with uh, what, appraise, what real estate appraisers do. It just happens to use the same term. But uh, that's if you have a disagreement over the uh, scope of the loss or the price. Some insurance companies can quarrel with you over the scope part. But certainly, if you believe you're owed X, the insurance company says we only think we owe you one half X, you have a right to request appraisal. And the appraisal process is supposed to be an expedited format by which 
You designate an appraiser, they designate an appraiser, and the two appraisers jointly designate a neutral third called an umpire, and the three of them try to come to a decision as to what is a fair amount. Most of the time, insurance companies don't like appraisal, even though it's provided for in their policy. Why? Because almost always, the dollar amount will be significantly higher that they're ordered to pay than what they were willing to uh, pay before you. So, how do you know if you have a strong global claim? Well, what's the dollar difference? That's, that's a pretty significant uh, indicator, obviously. The, the greater the difference, the stronger the global claim. Uh, a good policyholder attorney, that's what I am, uh, can assess the strengths and weaknesses of your global claim. Uh, in summary, uh, to know your rights, insurance companies must treat you fairly, must help you understand your policy and available coverages, and must respond to your communications in a timely manner and they're not supposed to bully you. You do not have to accept the insurance company's valuations. This is the point I was making earlier about going out and hiring your own contractor uh, to give you a uh, estimate. Uh, so, considering hiring your own contractor to provide an estimate, and that one I already get. Uh, if the insurance company is going to make a payment, they have to give you a copy of the estimate. On which they're basing that payment. Uh, I don't understand why sometimes insurance companies are reluctant to do that, but uh, that makes me a little suspicious when they are. Uh, but ask them to provide the estimate upon which they're basing the payment. Document, document, document. That's the point that uh, Carrie was making earlier, which is always uh, follow up and write it with them anytime you request them to do anything. All right, quickly. Sorry to run through this so fast, folks. Uh, under insurance, if you don't have enough insurance coverage to replace your home or the contents or other parts, then you very well may be underinsured. Uh, this, uh, unfortunately, is the most pervasive problem that folks face after a total loss. United Policyholders did a uh, survey of former King folks. Uh, they had, I think it was 156 uh, homes that were lost. It was right in that neighborhood anyway. And uh, more, or 64% of the people that responded to the survey reported that they were underinsured by what turned out to be an average of $200,000. Well, that's a really, really significant problem. And some of you may have a similar problem. Some of you, frankly, may not even be aware of it yet. Um, so, how do you know whether you're underinsured? Well, first of all, you have to measure against what is the policy allow for, and that's limits, and Karen had mentioned that. By the way, one other thing to look at under limits, because Karen talked about what does it say on the declarations page, and what does it say on endorsements, and then where are there additional coverages. Uh, oftentimes, insurance companies will have an inflation factor that can uh, be added on top of what the limits are. And the inflation factor oftentimes goes back to the date that the policy was last renewed. So if your policy renewed within a month or two before uh, the fire year, there's probably not going to be much difference. But if it renewed 11 months earlier, there's a chance that, you, that there may be some additional coverages there. And I would argue that that inflation dollar kicks in first before you then compute the 25% on top of that and the 10% on top of that. So there are little added factors here and there that at the end of the day, may not be six figures, but it may be up into the five figures or, or uh, thereabouts that you're able to get additional uh, money. So limits, that's a cap on the dwelling. Um, as Karen uh, mentioned, uh, other limits oftentimes flow from uh, the dwelling, uh, such as your coverage B, which are, typically is called coverage B, which is your detached uh, structures your personal property and contents, which I know is not really a focus tonight. Uh, additional living expense sometimes can also be uh, a factor, uh, and that's your paying for your living expenses as you're out of your home. That can sometimes be tied into your uh, coverage A. Uh, so, what's the insurance company's position on, on your limits? Because what happens is, when it comes time to rebuild your home, you go out and get an estimate, you say, holy Moses, it's going to cost me $500,000 to put this home back and I only have $350,000 of in insurance coverage. And uh, I hate to break it to you, but there's not many, I don't have any silver bullets in, in this regard with respect to forcing an insurance company to go back and rewrite its policy. 
So how did you, how do people end up in the situation again? Who chooses the limits? The insurance company will tell you, you chose your limits. Because they sent you a, and unfortunately the case is in Colorado support, uh, tender support this position, but they sent you a declarations page and, or an application and it had limits in there and you signed off on it. And you didn't raise a holy ruckus about it at the time. So to an insurance company think, that means you chose the limits. Because you did not object, you chose the limit. Well, reality, uh, the agent and the insurance company are likely who chose the limits. You probably went in and perhaps you filled out an application online, but you probably went in and talked to your agent or as a part of the process to close on a loan for your property. And uh, how many bedrooms, how many square feet, how old was the house, what's the type of construction, those types of questions. And then the agent goes back and does a little calculation using a software program that the insurance company probably provided to them. And they, they're the ones that told you, well, we can write your policy for $350,000. And then that sort of goes in the application. That then goes back to the insurance company's home office where there are a group of underwriters. Those are the people that are, you know, kind of back in a closet somewhere. They're the bean, bean counters. And they're the ones that then figure out, okay, $350,000 in the houses in, you know, uh, Colorado Springs area. Okay, that's the blah, 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 blah. And okay, three hundred fifty thousand dollars makes sense. So that's what ends up being put on your uh, policy. So I argue that really it's not the policyholder that chose the limits; it's you, Mr. Insurance Company, you, Ms. Uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Insurance Agent, that chose the limits. Uh, let's see. So if you don't, if you end up with not enough insurance. Uh, what are your uh, remedies? And skip to those. So, first thing to do is to ask the insurance company, and the magic word here is reform. There's a lot of other ways that we could ask insur insurance companies to reform their actions, but uh, ask the insurance company to reform the policy. That means to go back and, uh, after the fact, change the limits. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have an insurance company do that, the insurance company will uh, charge an appropriate, slightly additional amount for the premium. That's fair. Because if, you're, if you say in my hypothetical, well, I should have had $500,000 of coverage, and I'll tell you, okay, then you should have paid a couple hundred dollars more in premium. I'm sure at this point, each and, one of, each and every one of you would say, I'll go to the ATM, I'll be right back. <laughs> Ask the agent for help. Ask your agent for help. I'm going to come back to that one. Yes, it is. Uh, your agent or your broker, ask them to help you. I'm going to give you some pointers on that in a minute. So, uh, unfavorable Colorado law, Colorado law says you have a duty to read your policy. That means that if you have a limit, again, back to my hypothetical, $350,000, and you've got that declaration page that said $350,000, the insurance company is going to or the Colorado law says, well, you read that. You knew that you only had $350,000 of coverage. You know what the biggest problem is, folks? None of you had any point of reference at that point. How would you know that $350,000 wasn't enough to cover your home? You don't. You don't know. You don't know until after a loss happens and you go out and you hire a contractor to figure that out. So, agents do have a duty of reasonable care. That means they cannot act negligently. However, and this is a big however. Uh, it's limited to situations where the agent promises to obtain a specific type of insurance and fails to do so, and then they don't tell you about it. So this seems um, let me be polite here, but this 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 seems self-evident that if you go to the agent or the broker and you say, This is my home, that you expect that, that agent or broker is looking out for your best interest and wants to sell you as much coverage as you possibly can. That's what they would tell you that they want to do. Why? Because then they're on a higher commission. Well, alone, they don't want to price themselves out of the market because all their competition is doing the exact same thing. So they're all underpricing it. Um, the agent and the insurance company have no duty to ensure complete protection. Even if you go into them and you say, I want it all covered. Colorado law, unfortunately, does not say the insurance company or that the agent or broker 
has a duty to make sure that you do have adequate coverage. In order to find an agent liable, uh, as I do, uh, or as a private do, uh, you have to show that there's a special relationship there. Your normal insurance agent, insurance broker relationship is not qualified as a special relationship, unfortunately. So just the mere fact that they make a commission off of whatever the premium is paid is not a special relationship. So it typically includes payment of more than the premium for their advice. Uh, let's see. If you gave an affirmative and clear request for a particular type of insurance, you could argue that that gives rise to a special relationship. If the agent filled out the application, oftentimes the agents do fill out the application, they slide it in front of you and then ask you to sign it. They did it incorrectly. That could give rise to a special relationship. There was a Colorado Supreme Court case in 2011 that uh, seemed to soften the position a little bit of a policy or a duty to read their policy, but it hasn't really been tested yet in this particular agency relationship situation. So, this is what I was talking about in terms of coming back to the agent. Um, points of emphasis when discussing underinsurance with the insurance company and the agent or broker. Were there any written requests by you for particular coverage? Did you say, I need replacement cost coverage in writing to them? Any written promises by the agent to obtain particular types or amounts of coverage? Any verbal promises by the agent that he or she would obtain particular amounts of coverage? What discussion did you have with your agent about amounts of coverage? Were there any discussions about whether that would be enough to rebuild if you lost your home in a fire? All of these things, no one of these things becomes the magic bullet, but all of them together, or as many of them as you can trigger, would, will help you try to convince your agent to become your ally in terms of running uh, or going back to the insurance company and saying, we really ought to reform the policy to help these people out. Were there any meetings at your house with your agent or insurance uh, person? Did the insurance company send out an inspector? In which case, they took a look at your house. They didn't even have pictures of your house in their file. You don't even know it. Uh, that's the inspections or drive-bys. So uh, another way, so those are all arguments that you can try to lobby against the insurance company to try to convince them that they really need to reform the policy. Unfortunately, there's, not, there's nothing really, really solid out there that I can stand up in court and advocate on your behalf to try to get the insurance company to say, oh, well, okay, now that we know that, One, so there's some other things you can try to do to maximize your other available coverages or to maximize your coverage so that you're not using up all the replacement costs for things if there's other places in your policy that there are coverages. Uh, so those are oftentimes called additional coverages or additional coverages or supplemental coverages. And oftentimes there's sublimits, meaning that there's lesser than four mile limits to your trees and landscaping, debris removal, Debris removal, oftentimes there is a separate line item type of coverage for that in your policy, even though that may be within your exactimate replacement cost estimate. There's probably a line item in there for debris removal. But if you are going to max out your coverage for replacement costs, look to is there additional coverage somewhere else for debris removal? Oftentimes it's like 5% to 10%, something like that, of your entire coverage A coverage if you max out that coverage. Uh, building code upgrades, uh, upgrades coverage. So again, as uh, Karen had mentioned, oftentimes in uh, policies these days there's a 20% or some or 10 uh, 10 or 25% additional coverage you can get for code upgrades over and above the replacement cost coverage. Um, there is sometimes a thousand dollars or twelve twenty five hundred dollars required from the service charge. The adjuster should sit down with you and discuss all those coverages. And if they haven't yet, or they did it right when the loss first happened and you were so traumatized you couldn't remember which way it was up, ask the adjuster to do it again. Their obligation under their duties of good faith and fair dealing is to explain to you your policy and explain it in simple enough terms or in terms that are understandable to you. Up there earlier where I said I spent the first 20 years of my practice working on the other side, I was adjusters and their supervisors and their supervisors supervisors coming to me and saying, we can't figure out what our policy says. Can you please tell us? So don't let them make you think that you are not as smart as they are because you don't understand the policy. 
maybe they don't understand it either. But keep asking the questions and make them, uh, make them tell you what is in the policy. So, if you are looking for legal representation and you aren't interested in that or may not be there yet, look for a good experience policy or attorney. Um, know your rights. That's why I come down and do this, folks. That's why I come down and do this uh, on my own time. I want people like you to know and understand the rights. It's not right that insurance companies will try to take advantage of you because you don't know your rights. All right? Uh, if you do need legal representation, make sure you have get paid for it. You know it's first party property rights, and those are just my uh, law firms of violence that require for justice for the results and extra petition and good lawyers changing lives. Thanks. <laughs> So you guys, we are being a little over that happens sometimes, but boy, we've jam-packed a lot of info in here, which is always our goal. It was much useful information we hope that you can use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have us take our Q&A to 830. Um, all of our speakers, you guys okay to stay after to take questions? So we're going to take our group Q&A, and we have our Carla's going to handle the microphone, bless you, Carla. So you can direct us to somebody, you can ask a general question at 8.30, we'll cut off our Q&A, we'll do 10 to 15 minutes of breakout for whoever wants to participate, and then our speakers will stay out there. So anybody who has a question, it will be answered, whether it's in the big group setting or you just come up afterwards to our speakers, all right? So there's not going to be anybody who has a question where it doesn't get answered. Our first one, here we go. Can we get copies of the slides presented tonight? Yeah, they're available. Just Go to the UP website, they should be up by, I'm going to say, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so just www.uphelp.org. Um, the ones from the last day were up there for anybody who's gone on online. They are at the website. You can go through the whole thing and print it out. Including the, the legal one? The, the entire presentation from beginning to end will be on the website. Oh, and the county, not the PowerPoint, though, right here? And if you want to rewatch any of this, the county is very graciously and kindly videotaping it. They're going to tape up the meeting up on. So if you want to rewatch any of it on the county website, the PowerPoint slides up on the UP website. Okay? Great question. Do we have access to the Xactimate uh, program? I mean, it's a it's a program that you can buy. I think Carrie, what did you see? You, let's say change it, you can buy a 30 day trial to exactimate. It doesn't have the adjusted pricing on the 30 day purchase for El Paso County. You have to pay the full fee for one year to get the adjusted amount. What does the exactament do? I mean, it just shows you what they've already provided us, right? The exactament program provides different unit policies for the selection done by the Sure, and we, and we have that. We, we were provided that. Okay. So, I guess back to some of your comment that they, that should already been provided. We shouldn't need to go out and buy that program. Well, I think what, what they're referring to is there are things that the adjuster may not be selecting in the, in the line item that you're entitled to. And unless you have the program looking at it, uh, from a legal point of view, uh, would, can the insurance company say they're not like you want to picture? Each line item in your estimate, there's a click that you can pick on the line and it shows the pick a picture. Tells you what's included, tells you what's not included in that price. If they ask the insurance company for that, is the insurance company not obligated to give them a copy of that to that in support of the price that they chose to get their member? Uh, I would say that they should provide to you, and I, I would argue that they are legally uh, obligated to provide to you a complete copy of any estimate upon which they're releasing a payment. Let me amplify that a little bit on your, on your question, which uh, there's more than one way to estimate what is the value of the loss. Insurance companies like to use the exact estimating program because it's something A, they've already purchased, uh, but uh, their adjusters typically are trained on using that. 
They may not be trained adequately, but they're, they're trained in some manner uh, to use it. So that's what they like to use. What I was talking about is uh, you may want to go out and get a contractor who uses something other than the exact estimating uh, process, because most contractors, their estimates are going to be a couple of pages long, uh, because there'll be a category for uh, you know, lumber, a category for windows, you know, uh, stuff like mechanical, and stuff like that. Whereas in, in a exactly uh, method, it's going to be every single room, this exact square footage of each side of each wall in every single room. So it may be 50, 75, 100 pages long. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's any better than what you're building with uh, if you're going to go hire, you know, the ABC you know, builders. Their estimate is probably three pages long, but maybe even more money because they're going to look at it, frankly, more likely on a cost per square foot basis. So that's the type of estimate I was talking about. Okay. And we, we have been provided that estimate. We were provided that estimate, like, inside of three or four days of the loss, and we've been, we've been paid, and we are underinsured um, from the standpoint of their own numbers. They, their numbers of that exact estimate was upwards of $30,000 less than what, uh, you know, their, their, their exact total was over $30,000 what they ended up paying us. So we are at the stage where we're uh, talking to a builder and essentially going to give him that exact without the numbers and say, you, you know, here's what they say, or, or should we, I guess my question to you is, should we build with him the house that we had and not use that same description that we gave our adjuster, or should we have to use the same line items so that at some point whether we decide to take action with an uh, attorney, they actually could see that per line their numbers were highly skewed or, or not. I would talk to your builder uh, about what he or she feels most comfortable doing. Most builders have no familiarity whatsoever with the exact in the software program will look at that and say, what the heck is this? Uh, this, this is you know, Greek to me. So uh, I, I, I would, as a lawyer, I would not feel comfortable asking my expert to venture into unfamiliar waters. I want my expert to do what they would normally do, which would be to use the normal, whatever program it is or whatever method it is that they typically use, because that's going to be what they feel most solidly about and then send out to the insurance company. It's up to the insurance company to do the cross-referencing. But chances are that the bill is looking at it again more like a cost per square foot basis rather than on a wall-by-wall -wall type of basis. Gotcha. And then one other real quick question and a couple of uh, questions. My wife and I are essentially at the stage where our, we, our agent is not, is not willing to put anything right. She's not really, you know, I could just tell her how I talk to her. She's like, I don't want to talk to you no more. I don't want to say nothing. You know. So the questions that you have up on the board uh, is right, really probably the last thing that we'll do before we end up hiring someone to, um, of course, this would be prior to us get, get the last of our money for our contents once we get that list finished. Um, is that something that you would recommend after those questions are asked? Just take those answers if we get anything in writing and just pursue trying to capture what money we get based on the estimate from a builder? Well, uh, I would say open up a dialogue with uh, any number of lawyers or uh, any lawyer that you may pick and uh, consult with him or her on an individualized basis. Obviously, you know, I'm much more, much more generalized in nature. Uh, I will tell you that uh, I don't take very many underinsured cases because they're really, really hard cases to prove for the reasons that I said earlier. Uh, even when, and your situation is not unique, even when the adjuster's the very first exact investment comes out at some dollar amount that's way higher than what your limits were. Yeah. And at that point, you look at it and you say, how the heck did we get here? Thank you. Right. Folks, uh, having just gone through this, I can tell you what I did. We went to a builder, like Tom's explaining, we got a breakdown for roofing, for mechanical, for plumbing, what's called a trades breakdown. 
and how we may be able to expand on this, but I demanded of our insurance company that they provide a trades breakdown, and they were able to click the right box in Xactimate and give me a trades breakdown. Now, it was about 60 pages back in my estimate of loss provided by the company, but I did get it. And so once I got that format, it was very easy for me to compare apples to apples, my contractor's bid from what they're willing to, to pay in terms of things like concrete or mechanical, electrical, whatever it might be. I have a question. We recently got our, um, well, we're still dealing with the insurance, but they, I don't know if this is a common thing or what, but they depreciated our demolition. Now, to me, a demolition <laughs> is a, is a no, service. No, I can't do that. Okay. <laughs> so I can go back to them and tell them this is illegal. Not illegal. Tell them they need to cut you the check for the depreciated demolition and crank that given in 10 days. Now, what happens when they don't have to do that? Good luck. Right? Who's your insurance? Give them, give them a definite time. You had um, talked about the uh, coverage for the fire department. How do you invoke and make that work? Does that mean that it goes to the fire department? Because we receive, as a community, a between six and $12,000 loss of equipment fighting the fire. So how do we get our insurance company to pay that? Is it to us, to the fire department? I've not seen, a, typically, that claim is for a, what's called a fire department service charge, which is if the fire department makes a trip and they charge you, the homeowner, for coming to your property, it, it, doesn't, it does not normally happen on a widespread basis like this, but if they come to your property and fight a fire, or if it, you were just a one house fire and you get a bill for some segment of that work, that's what that covers. I've never seen anyone try to make that uh, apply to cover uh, a, a cost of lost firefighting equipment. I doubt that that coverage would uh, extend to that. Okay, uh, I talked to one of the board members of the fire department and they were unwilling to tender us a bill so we could try to make a claim. And it's kind of a slippery slope. So. Well, and, and uh, maybe the fire insurance, or maybe the fire department had their own insurance coverage that they could uh, make a claim on as well. Covered by the insurance 
from a adjuster's point of view, it's the homeowner's responsibility to prove their claim and you have to bear the cost of that from a legal point of view. <laughs> from a legal point of view, uh, probably not, but it's always worth giving it a shot. Uh, oftentimes contractors will come out and free of charge give you the estimate. Why? Because they're hoping they're going to get the job. Uh, but if you are having to go out and hire an expert, I view that as a litigation cost that might for fronts on behalf of my clients. But the only chance I have of recovering that is if I go through a lawsuit and win that lawsuit and then they're forced to pay, pay my costs. I'm talking specifically an industrial hygienist that comes in and checks for soot and carbon within the house. Yes. I was just going to say, um, and I'm going to carry through that in a second, but from a pragmatic standpoint, if you do end up hiring an expert on any aspect and make that argument to the insurance company, whatever, it's whether you hire your independent scope of laws or a hygienist, and they change position on the lines on that, I would claim it as a, as a, as a claims cost, a co a, an adjustment cost under ALA and submit. I think that creates a very strong leverage. If they change position based on the documentation that you provided, that that was a required cost of, of adjustment. As a rule, what we've seen in Walton Canyon across the board with the different insurance companies, um, in my, in, you know, the people I've spoken with, in my own experience, is that they're happy to pay for it if it's their expert that they chose. Um, but if you do not agree with their expert, you do not want to use their expert, then they will tell you the rule they won't pay for it. However, you have had it paid for after the fact in some cases. So, um, because it's certainly a cost you wouldn't have had if you hadn't had the incident. Um, so, if they have oppositional findings that are clear enough and a reputable enough company that changes the outcome, then they pretty much tend to pay for it. Um, but that's hard to find with the industrial hygienists, and we're actually working on that. UP is working on, um, we have a, a couple from out of state that have a great amount of experience in rechecking references and rechecking references right now to try to have a forum on partial loss with industrial hygienists, just like these gentlemen are here helping us, because it is a tough thing to find and, and they can test the air. They test the air 10 months later, there isn't going to be any carbon hanging in the air. They're testing for carbon. They're testing for other things, they may find it. So what they test for and pays for it can often determine the outcome, and that's why you have to check references so carefully. You guys, before we go to break out, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank Charles Craig from the I see in the back and just say thank you for being here for being supporting our uh, our program for tonight. I'm going to be able to stand up and wave our arm, but thank you so much for being here.